A kink in a line set creates a bottleneck in refrigerant flow. As refrigerant forces its way through that restriction, pressure drops. Because pressure and temperature are closely tied, that pressure drop also leads to a temperature drop. That just so happens to be exactly how a TXV works, by creating a controlled pressure drop to meet a refrigerant into the evaporator. Now add a clogged filter dryer to the mix, and suddenly you have three restrictions, all capable of producing similar symptoms, unusual superheat, off-pressure readings, and poor cooling performance. But here's the difference, and it's everything. The location of that temperature change. Finding it is the key to avoiding a misdiagnosed TXV. And sometimes, the real issue isn't a restriction at all. It's something obscure, something that can be revealed by a 5-minute microfarad check. And missing it can lead to hours of wasted troubleshooting or unnecessary part swaps. So the whole purpose of a TXV is to meter how much refrigerant flows into the evaporator coil based on how much heat is flowing over the evaporator coil. The higher the heat load, the more refrigerant gets delivered to the coil. The lower the heat load, the less refrigerant. Now, an interesting thing happens when a metering device does what it's supposed to do. Our superheat reading stays pretty consistent. It has a very narrow drift um, and it doesn't change very much. So it doesn't matter if it's 90 degrees outside or 70 degrees, our superheat is going to remain fairly stable. Now, take a look at this dotted line you see on the graph. That is the changing superheat values on a fixed orifice metering device. A fixed orifice metering device is always delivering the same amount of refrigerant to the evaporator coil no matter what the conditions are. So if we have a very high heat load on the house, that extra heat is going to increase the temperature of our vapor refrigerant, which is going to increase our superheat reading. And when those loads drop off to much lower, so will our superheat. When a TXV starts to malfunction, it can often take on a lot of the characteristics of a fixed metering device. So if our TXV is throttled closed, for example, it's always going to deliver a very small amount of refrigerant. And so with changing loads on a house, our superheat is going to change with it, just like a fixed orifice. Now, sometimes even a malfunctioning TXV could be like a broken clock. It's right twice a day. If we have a very low load on the house, let's say it's 75 degrees, you put your set point to 72, the amount of refrigerant being delivered by a metering device that's throttled to the closed position might be just the right amount of refrigerant for that particular load. But as the day goes on, the load gets higher, more heat, the TXV doesn't modulate to compensate for that, and now our system isn't working properly. And this is what leads to a lot of technicians misdiagnosing TXV issues is because there's so many variables in play that you kind of have to eliminate everything else first before you can condemn a TXV. And this requires looking at the system as a whole, taking a lot of different temperatures, and understanding how to interpret them. Now, I can't do a TXV diagnostics video without bringing up ABC, airflow before charge. Always check airflow before you even start trying to interpret pressures on your gauges. Now, I find the best method to do this is just to check the amperage draw on the blow motor itself. Amperage readings on permanent split capacitor motors are pretty straightforward. Uh, if you have airflow restrictions, the motor is not going to be moving as much of a volume of air, so it's going to use less amperage. It's going to work less. ECM motors can be a little bit more complicated in interpreting amperage draws because they do compensate, but you generally want to do a lot more than just put your hand up to the grill because that can be deceiving. Earlier in a video, I mentioned how a microfarad reading can save you hours of turmoil. You check your tap speed, you check your dip switches, that looks all okay. You put your hand up to the vent, there's air blowing out. Uh, you wouldn't know any better that a capacitor doesn't always fail sometimes they get very weak and the motor starts but it doesn't ramp up to full capacity it only running 50 or 60 percent now it only takes three minutes to do this it's not a big deal uh, if it's not the problem it's only three minutes wasted but if it is the problem it could take you hours to come around to it if that thought never occurs to you now, once we eliminate airflow as a possible problem that pretty much whittles everything down to the refrigeration cycle itself now, there could be a couple of things going wrong here. We can have a kink line set. We can have a plugged filter dryer. We can even have poor compression on the compressor itself. So there's a lot more going on than just the possibility of a bad TXV. Now, I immediately kicked off this video talking about what happens across a kink in a copper line set. Now, this is really easy to test for. All you need to do is take a temperature reading of your liquid line, 
down by the service port and a condensing unit outside, and then take another reading on the liquid line just before it enters the evaporator coil on the indoor unit. Now you want to make sure you don't have a filter dryer in between these two readings. You just want to read the line itself. So if the filter dryer is located outside, start your temperature reading after it. And if it's located inside, take your temperature reading just before it. Now you're always going to see maybe one, two, maybe even three degree difference along the whole length of the line set. But if you're seeing five, 10 degrees, even more, uh, that is a very strong indicator of a kink somewhere. Now, checking for a restriction in a filter dryer is exactly the same thing. You just take temperatures on both sides of the dryer. Now, seeing one to two degree difference, pretty normal, not a big deal. But if you're seeing five, ten plus, that's definitely a problem. Now, both of these problems can limit the amount of refrigerant that's actually making it to the TXV. So even if the TXV is operating properly, it's not going to be able to meter the proper amount of refrigerant into the evaporator coil because it's not getting the proper amount of refrigerant. So we're going to still see a high superheat reading under these conditions, even with a TXV that's running properly. Another potential problem is poor compression on the compressor itself. When you have a very poor compression ratio, the compressor cannot create the pressure drop in the evaporator needed to create the pressure imbalance across the TXV that actually gets liquid refrigerant to flow through the system. So with bad compression, your TXV may be throttling open trying to feed refrigerant in, but because the pressure drop is not there, the refrigerant doesn't feed in as quickly, and so it acts like a starved coil. And once again, we end up with a high superheat. Now, keep in mind, all these problems, the kink line set, the plugged filter dryer, poor compression, uh, we could still have a fairly normal subcooling reading, even if our head pressure is lower due to the poor compression. Now, TXVs don't always get stuck close. Sometimes they get stuck open, and they end up flooding the evaporator coil with too much refrigerant. A strong sign of this is going to be a very low superheat reading. Now, just like everything else in HVAC, multiple problems, same symptoms. This is why we check airflow first. Airflow is typically the other reason why you can end up with a flooded evaporator coil with a TXV that's working properly because we're simply not delivering enough heat. This, by the way, is the reason why we don't charge units in low ambient temperatures because if the heat load simply isn't there, even with a brand new system and everything's working perfectly, uh, we're still going to end up with a flood evaporator coil and we can't dial in a charge under those kinds of conditions. Speaking of which, sometimes the problem is simply just a low charge. And this is going to be pretty apparent because your superheat is going to be high, your subcooling is going to be low, the delta T across your evaporator coil is going to be very low, your suction pressure will be low, head pressure will be low. I mean, it'll be low across the board. Now, at this point, if you've pretty much eliminated all these other possibilities and you're strongly suspecting it may be a bad TXV, the next thing you want to do is you really just kind of want to confirm it. Can heat up the sensing bulb or cool it down or see if it has some kind of reaction and if the thermal expansion valve reacts to those changes. Um, if it doesn't seem to react, then you definitely have an issue there. 